If I've been so emotionally drained at uh, the handshakes, mm. I've hugged people. And, you know, they really appreciate that. And it's, it's not like, okay, I feel that I have to. It, it just, we connect it. So you feel like they're pain. You, you, one of the, you want to save them. We love the San Gabriel Valley. There are some amazing people and businesses here, and we think they deserve the spotlight. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the SGV Master, Master Key, Key Podcast. Podcast. We'll have on the people that make the SGV great. We'll find out what makes them tick, their ups and downs, their history, and we're going to have fun doing it. This is the SGV Master Key Podcast. And now your hosts, Scott Warmoth and Russell Mano. All right, SGVers, welcome back to another episode of the SGV Master Key Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you're new here, we bring you the stories of the people of the San Gabriel Valley. And if you're a returning listener, uh, we're excited to bring you another guest from right here in the San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. And, you know, today we started out our, our morning planning to go on a hike, our typical hike that our listeners are familiar with. And we got rained out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, up in the foothills, up at the top of, well, Altadena, really, tip of Lake Avenue, right. uh, Mount Low. It's interesting that, you know, so that's, you you go up from Pasadena, you go into Altadena, right? But Pasadena is where you used to live. It's, it's where I live. It's a big part of the show, I would say, right? Because a lot of our guests and... Uh, well, it's the there? center of the San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, yeah, a lot of guests. And we, and we were talking about what a great city it is. You know, it's a great community. It's got just great facilities, great amenities. Just one of the finest cities, I believe, in L.A. County, if not all of the world. Sure. And, you know, I was speaking to James uh, DiPietro uh, from Crown City Podcast, who's going to be a guest on our show later on down the line. But... Uh, he asked me, he said, where do you live in Pasadena? And I said, well, I, I don't live on North or South Orange Grove Boulevard. <laughs> and he, you know, he smiled and he's like, well, yeah, not very many people do. And I said, oh, Scott used to live there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Well, I, I've lived around the Rose Bowl for years and 30 years. You know, I just, it's just a great area. I was not, I'm not native to California. So when I went to Pasadena, I thought, you know, this is great for our family. It's the nicest city that I, I've, I've never liked Los Angeles, nothing about Los Angeles. And, but I got to Pasadena and I thought, wow, I could brag about this city. Yeah. This is such a nice place. And, and people who care. And today we have on our show, you know, a good example of the type of caring that exists in in Pasadena. Yeah, absolutely. And before we get to uh, introducing our guest, uh, I just want to remind people that San Gabriel Valley Now is your source for city news, announcements, events, special savings, and everything SGV. Check them out on Instagram, sgv.now. Read their new SGV Now magazine, which we're featured in, and they did a great uh, uh, piece for us. Actually, Carlos uh, created that for us. Uh, we just provided the text. So thank you, Carlos. Uh, yeah, thank you, Carlos. So check them out on their website, sgvnow.com. Well, uh, we're talking about Pasadena and what's the relation to our guest. Well, our guest today has dedicated, uh, you know, his his work and his time service to serving the people of Pasadena. His name is Eduardo Acosta. He's the Hope Officer for Pasadena Police Department. Eduardo, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, you obviously have a connection to the San Gabriel Valley, but aside from your, your duty, what's your connection to the San Gabriel Valley? Well, I've uh, I started my career with the Sheriff's Department and I got hired with South Pasadena. So between South Pasadena and Pasadena, I've been serving the community for about 18 years. 18 years? Yeah. Just with South Pasadena and Pasadena. Did you grow up? Are you from originally the San Gabriel Valley? I am not. Where are you from originally? Um, city of LA. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. It's I okay. take back everything I said. No, 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 no. It's okay. I, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you grew up in L.A.? Yes. And uh, what was life like for you? Did you, you know, know your career path when you were younger? It was, it was nice. Um, uh, you know, I didn't really know my career path at that point in time. My uncle got me into where I am now, just tell him th telling me that they go test for this position, and I did, and now I'm here. So you started with the sheriff's department. Yes, sir. Okay. So you were probably based in Monterey Park, or you went through the academy there? Well, I went through uh, Whittier. Uh, oh, Sheriff's okay. Academy. 
um, did custody time, and then I uh, did a little bit of patrol time as well. What are some of the things in your young life that uh, maybe put you on this path where you wanted to, you know, be in law enforcement? I don't really think I thought about it when I was growing up. Um, like I said, my when I was going through college, my uncle told me about this position. Um, I didn't think I was going to like it. Uh, I applied for it, got into it, and saw she wrote. I loved. I fell in love with the the uh, law enforcement. Yeah. Why did Why didn't you think you were going to like it? Uh, it was new. I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but the more and more training I got and seeing how people work and I, I just liked it. Was it surprising to people around you that you went into law enforcement? Not really. Um, they supported whatever I wanted to do. Um, and no matter if it was law enforcement or some other career, they, my family was always going to support us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. You came from a supportive family. hundred percent. Yeah, that's really important. I, I asked that question because I have a nephew right now who is uh, wanting to go into law enforcement and wanting to go into, I guess, I think he might have been turned down by the academy, so he might have to start with a smaller city. Right. But yeah, it, it was a bit surprising to the family because he just had never seemed to be the type that would go into that type of field. I, I, I mean, it takes a special kind of person. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah, you definitely have to be, want to learn, tough skin, um, just be able to talk to people. Communication imp 100%. important. Yes. Yeah. So Eduardo, uh, you said 18 years, both in South Pass and Pasadena. Yes. What, what year is that, Scott, that he started? Oh, 18 years ago would be 20, 2005. Okay, 2005. What was South Pass like at that time compared to now or the changes that you've seen in the San Gabriel Valley or specifically those communities that you've served? Well, I always just refer to South Pasadena as like very family, very small community. You can drive down the street and you, and you know the neighbors. You know who's driving through to work and just a community. And it was really, and especially with the police department too, really tight community. And then I, I really like that environment. And what about Pasadena? Pasadena is more of a larger scale. It reminds me of when I used to have my time in um, with LA County, a little bit more fast paced, a uh, bigger city, a lot more things to do, uh, a lot more opportunities. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> opportunities? Uh, just promotions, oh. uh, specialized units. They do a lot of rotate, rotating in and out of those, uh, those units to get people time to experience it for themselves. Um, so you're not stuck in one position for your, your entire career. Makes everything fresh for the officers. I see. Mm -hmm. So I had a, uh, I have a friend, former client, he's retired LAPD yes. and I've asked him for many years to come on. He's vehemently declined. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I thought that's interesting, you know, but, but he's, he's older, he's maybe, you know, close to 70 and he would describe the tactics of police officers before. And he just said like, this was just, how they did things and it's, it's how it's changed so much. But right. you know, he was in a different force then. What sort of things did you do as a, as a young officer, uh, you know, in South Pasadena? Were you, were you a patrol officer? Like, I don't I have, I know no, nothing about right. policing. Started on a patrol um, and then I became, a, oh, it was assigned to the uh, San Gabriel, I'm sorry, the West San Gabriel Anti-Crime Task Force. So that was multi agencies, your Arcadia, Monterey Park, Monrovia, uh, El Monte, Pasadena, South Pasadena. And we just went after the burglars or whatever other issues were going on in the cities. So we're county, well not county, but San Gabriel Valley wide. So you would actually uh, work with the other agencies yes. then, almost like there were no uh, borders? Exactly. Oh. Yeah, San Gabriel Valley was ours. Wow. Yeah. Is that a standard, um, is that still, it's still like that? Uh, unfortunately it's not because of numbers, law, uh, our officers with each department, they were trying to hire more people. So we had to go back to our agencies and, you know, go back to patrol or detectives. So you started uh, as a patrolman, is that correct? You yes. started in patrol and then you went to this, uh, is it like a task force or what is that referred uh, to? It falls under the uh, detective bureau, but it's a, it's a task force. Anything interesting happened during that time that you can share with us? I've been in other counties. What does that mean? Um, so let's say, for example, one of, uh, we were serving a search warrant on oh. a burglar 
somewhere in South Pasadena. We ended up in Riverside County. Oh. And um, that was really interesting search warrant. Um, I was part of the SWAT team then as well. So filing cases in a different county was pretty interesting too. So we and, and you'd have to work with that agency. Yes. Uh, in advance. You, yes. You wouldn't just go in. No. And, no. Yeah. Yeah. We have to let them know we're there and if they want to come support or just the simple fact that they know we're there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What was it like serving uh, SWAT? It was, it was good. I, I really enjoyed that. It was like my, one of my bucket lists, if you, if you want to say, uh-huh. in law enforcement. I really enjoyed the training. I'm a big, I, big training guy. The, the more knowledge you know, the better you're going to be. And I, I enjoyed my time on the team. We were actually the first uh, SWAT team in uh, South Pasadena history. Oh. Yeah. oh wow. So when you say training, I imagine they're like weapons and tactics, right? Because that's what they stand for. But do they also train you in de-escalation, communication, those sorts of things? De-escalation, uh, CPR, um, giving medical assistance to people. We, we, we're the catch-all. You have, the more you know, the better you're off. Wow. I would imagine that most of your job is not that interesting, right? There's no major events to deal with in the course of a typical day, but it's, uh, maybe I shouldn't have used the word interesting, but just not that eventful. Uh, Probably talking to people, doing things that, uh, you know, you're not on a, you're not on a car chase eight hours a day (laughs) or 10 hours a day, right? Well, it it, it all what you make of your position, no matter what position you're in, you could sit back in your car in your car and wait for calls. That's not really interesting. Yeah. Or you can get out there, engage with the community, find out what's going on, what are the concerns, you know, talking to people. They're yeah. the community I always say are our eyes and ears. Yeah. To what's really going on. Yeah, I probably didn't phrase that very well. I think what I meant was that you're probably involved in more day-to-day things right. that are, you know, not car chases or, or SWAT events, you right. know, so it's probably not as, um, I don't, it's like just, he's not breaking down doors and, and, yeah, you know, right. Yeah. Taking down the Thank you. All the time. yeah. Sometimes I need Russell to, <laughs> <laughs> to tell me what I'm thinking. It's not like the, like, like cops still at like 24 yeah, seven. It's not right. all like cop stories, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe for someone who's interested in policing, is this path that you took also to sort of accelerate your career, like going through SWAT and, and this other task force? Uh, it, it has, um, and, and I took advantage of uh, as much training as I can get, especially working in South Pasadena. There's not always gonna be a motor officer or always gonna be somebody who knows to help you with a drug investigation or a DUI investigation. You have to learn that yourself. So that's why I put forth the training, um, the time to better myself, to know, not to rely on anybody else, to know how to do the investigation from uh, beginning to end. What does that mean, a drug or DUI investigation? Like like a traffic, um, you pull over someone for traffic and you suspect that they're under the influence, like then you start to investigate them then? Correct, correct. Um, If you believe that they're under the influence, just run a couple of simple tests, you know, having them exit the car, doing the uh, field sobriety test, from that to the like the breathalyzer or if they want to give blood to see how much alcohol in there's in the system it's an entire investigation right yeah well i'm, I'm thankful i never I, I don't drink but uh you know those, those type of scenarios they feel they feel frightening you know to be examined you know mm-hmm. on the spot and looked at like i, I would never want to be in that sort of situation mm-hmm. but what happens uh, so you leave south pass uh, you were in SWAT at South Pass, and now you come over to Pasadena Police Department. Yes. How long have you been with Pasadena? Uh, say about eight years now. Eight years. Yeah. And uh, what do you what do you think of the the city? Um, I, I like the the pace. Um, South Pasadena was a slower pace, um, but coming to Pasadena is a little bit more uh, faster pace, and that's what I was kind of used to uh, working with Sheriff's Department. Um, it, it makes the day go by pretty quick. Um, I, d- I just love the city. 
And I introduced you as the HOPE officer. Can you share with the listeners what, what does that mean? So the HOPE officer is the Homeless Outreach Psychological Evaluation Team. We are first responders. We do have a partner from the department, LA County Department of Mental Health, that rides along with us. Um, and it could be from trying to outreach a homeless individual to conducting a psychological evaluation on homeless, somebody, a resident, just anybody that comes into the city. They, they ride along with you. Yes. And so they, they're, they're there on the spot when yes. you respond to a call. And let's say you get to a scene or a call and there's somebody there and you're evaluating. Oh, what happens if you determine, okay, this person just needs some mental health assistance? Well, if, it, if, if we're not going to put them on a mental health hold, we'll just recommend uh, services. We schedule appointments in the past for individuals uh, for later date and times if they don't, if they don't need immediate assistance. Um, if they need immediate assistance, uh, talk to a health care provider. Uh, we will put them on a hold, uh, take them to either the hospital or facility and then they'll be evaluated in that setting. Oh, the people coming with you, they're, they're not gonna provide mental health care there on the spot as a responder? They do the mental health evaluation, they conduct it, figure out whether or not this person fits criteria. I see. And then if they, they believe they do, then we assist, we actually drive them to the facility. Wow. Mm -hmm. How many officers uh, are on the HOPE team? We have currently three officers and three LA County uh, clinicians. Okay, so, and you and your partner um, here today are both members of that? Yes. Or? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there would just be one other HOPE officer. So there's officer. three teams, three officers. Oh, oh th yeah, okay. With, with three clinicians. Yeah. Okay. So three teams. I see. And, and this is your full time assignment yes okay so you're always together with your hope partners yes um with the um civilian aspect of it our clinicians yes mm -hmm. um we ride together f the entire week with the teams our our schedules are offset a day or two mm -hmm. so there's um almost full coverage for the week okay yeah. so uh, if somebody called in uh with let's say calls dispatch with uh, a complaint that maybe somebody is uh, in their neighborhood, mm -hmm. y y that would go to you then? Dispatch would contact you? Yes. Um, they will also send patrol to, to assist if needed, depending on what they're doing. And then um, we'll take over the investigation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're not on active patrol? We assist patrol as much as we can. Uh -huh. um, but we're we're out there driving around. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, we're in the city. Yeah, okay. So who? So you obviously take the lead um, as a police officer, I would imagine. Yes. And then you would turn it over to your clinicians if if it seems to be the right. Well, we're we're situation. there for protection. We, as an officer, we can write the evaluations as well. We were trained in the academy for that. Mm -hmm. um, but once the scene is safe then we bring in our partners um, and they can conduct the investigation or the uh, evaluation so this is a very topical issue and how uh the way the city of pasadena is handling it is this common to the way other departments are handling it uh, uh, nationwide yes for uh, california mm -hmm. as far as down as san diego they have a team as well a lot bigger than us um, but that's, this is like the thing for mental health and homelessness right. and yeah. How was it that you became part of the team? I was asked by one of the uh, former team members. Um, mm -hmm. she was rotating out. She asked me to, you know, to ask just a couple of questions on how the team was ra were, uh, ran mm -hmm. and it seemed interesting. And I, I just took it. I just said, sure, let's, yeah. let's do it. I would think it's one of the most very important areas of police work today yes absolutely yeah 100 percent. how is the homeless uh situation in pasadena i i don't know uh whether it's worse than other cities of similar size or 
Uh, how, do you know how to judge that? I think we, we, we have a lot of different teams or organizations that we work well with. There are certain rules that, you know, a homeless individual has to follow in Pasadena. If, if they want our help, we are 100% on board with, with whatever they need, with whether it's housing, whatever they need to get off the streets. We will work with anybody if mm -hmm. they want the help. This is interesting, you know, so my friend, uh, Joe, he talks about, oh, you know, there's other departments and they're gonna, they're gonna strip, you know, X amount of officers, 50% of the officers and only mental health professionals are gonna respond to certain situations. And he laughs at that. He's like, you know, good luck with that because there's, you know, his 40 plus years on the force, he's encountered a lot of dangerous people. And so in my mind, I, I was thinking like, okay, maybe departments across the United States are moving towards less armed response and just mental health. And I was like, how's that gonna look? This is the first time that I, I'm actually learning that you, you're going together right. out to the community. And that's a much different uh, look and thought than, than what I had envisioned. Maybe maybe it is only different here, but um, yeah. And, and so this topic of changing how police forces respond, even even defunding uh, certain police forces to, to fund mental health response, like this is a big thing and across the nation, I would say. Right. Oh yeah, it's. I believe the most important subject yes. that that we can deal with today in in the U.S. Quite honestly, it's it's uh, it's very huge. I see all this crime happening across California and maybe you know other states, and I, I'm not sure if it's just if it is an increase or if it's just because it's at our fingertips now, and now I can see all of it. Right. I'm not really sure how much that is, but how brazen criminals are, and I'm like, is that coming to San Gabriel Valley, is that coming to Pasadena? Yeah. And I'm so thankful that it seems like it hasn't. Is that what you experience? It's, it's, it's uh, countywide, almost statewide went with, um, when I was a young officer, a, a lot of things changed. Uh, crimes were lessened. They weren't staying in jail. And it, it, it just changed the, my last well, 15 years or so. But you're not seeing like the, the really brazen criminals as, you know, just walking into a stores here in Pasadena, walking out with goods and, you know, you're not seeing, or you are seeing yeah, that. We are seeing that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't think it's as big as uh, a group of people just trying to take over a store. That doesn't have really happen here. Very, very rare. Um, but yeah, um, they just, there are people that they know that limit. Is it $950? Don't take more than that. And it's just a misdemeanor. Wow. Yeah. Well, sorry to come off topic. I mean, you're, you're here to, to talk about, you know, what you're doing and, and the hope. Uh, Eduardo, we ask each guest to bring an item of significance with them. Uh, what did you bring with you today? I brought uh, our hope brochure. It's a um, referral guide that we hand out to individuals. It has uh, quite a few services in here that um, from homeless to mental health to medical to detox facilities for older uh, individuals, uh, children, um, our veterans. So it's, it's good information that we provide the community. How long has the program been in operation in it Pasadena? It started in 2002. Oh, so wow. a long yeah, time. It's, we've been around for a while. Okay. Yeah. I, I live in East Pasadena and I, I see the homeless there. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe less than a dozen. I can, I can, I know if I go to a certain area, this person may be there and I see them right. regularly. Right. Um, maybe two, three years ago, I, I felt like there was like this influx of homeless and then it sort of just dissipated. Right. Am I imagining that or, or did you guys also see that? Uh, we, we have. Um, I, I, I would say that the, the Metro train is, you know, people come into Pasadena, they'll panhandle and then they'll leave mm. and then we actually have our transits that st stay in the city which is not a, a whole lot it's just more that during the day like business hours and that's uh, coming from other cities right so i see oh they come and then they leave at night yes oh really mm -hmm. is it because they believe like passing is more affluent and they can get more money here yes uh passing you know, there's Besides the residents, um, people working in Pasadena, it, it just, you can have up to a, a billion people in the city at one point in time, and people are, are generous, and they'll hand out money and water or whatever, and people know that, and they'll come and panhandle and they'll, they'll leave. 
Oh, yeah. What what is the law uh, on panhandling? Uh, so long you're not impeding traffic. So if you step off into the roadway, um, other than that, it's totally legal. Really? Yes. Wow. But you have to follow rules on how how you do it. <laughs> and yeah. they they know the rules. They right? know the for the most part they know the Are rules. Are they trained by people? <laughs> <laughs> how do they know? I think they just feed off of each other. They just really learn, learn the ways from each other. I mean, wow! Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. What is the event that you have coming up in September? So it's a, uh, I consider the huge event, uh, mental. I uh, say, excuse me, suicide awareness month. They dedicate one of the weeks to um, National Suicide Awareness Walk. This year, we're gonna do it on September the thirteenth at the Rose Bowl. It's gonna be checking. It's gonna be at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, it's going to go through about noon, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so far, we have 18 organizations. Everybody in San Gabriel Valley, the community, welcome. It's a free event. I feel that our fire department and our police department are part of the San Gabriel Valley community. We want them to come too. Um, so right now, we have over 18 organizations. They're going to come out and give information to the community. We're going to have off, uh, police stations, fire departments come out and participate in the walk as well. We'd usually do maybe one or two laps around the Rose Bowl, or as my partner would do uh, a run around the Rose Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great event just for wellness and, and they dedicate the entire month. Good too, just to let people know they're, this is okay, they're not alone and, and, and there's help out there. You remember, yeah. Russell, we had probably a couple months ago a, a guest who had considered suicide at one point. Yes, In Justin. his life, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's such, um, such a sad thought. And, you know, I live, not now, but I lived for many years and would walk very close to um, a bridge. The Pasadena I know Bridge? It as, yeah, I don't Colorado, know, Colorado, Colorado Street Bridge, Street bridge yes. yes which has now had to be sort of not boarded up, but fenced off right. because of the suicides that occur there. It was such a tragic, sad yes. situation. And I would walk across the bridge occasionally, there'd be flowers yeah. mem you know, commemorating maybe a person who had gone there. And that's still a problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's still an attractive spot for people who are thinking about this. It, it is. and and. We, like I said earlier in the interview, we, we, we have those eyes and ears. When yeah. People driving across the bridge, they see whether the, somebody looks sad or they're actually over the fence line already. Yeah. So we, we take it very, very seriously. We have a crisis negotiation team that comes out to talk to the individual. Um, Hope officers as well will talk to the individual, try and convince that person to come back over and be quite honest, save a life. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Boy, you must be proud when you can save a life like that. It's it's emotionally draining, but once if you can save that person's life for just one more yeah. day, very good feeling, great feeling. Yeah, yeah. You, you just wonder what drives a person. Uh, what kind of training have you had to work this kind of situation? Well, our training started in the academy, just a block of mental health and um, you know, filling out the forms and whatnot. But there are, there are other classes that you could take, uh, trainings uh, but for like like your autism, you know, bipolar, schizophrenic. We, we get a lot of training, especially. And you can identify these different conditions. For, for the most part. And then when you add our LA County clinicians yeah, in there, right. they're, the, they're the experts. Right. They're the experts, so yeah. So you have to know how to talk to each of these different types of people. Yeah, and it's, and it's different each and every time. Yeah. Yeah. There's different influences or factors. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And when you're when you're trying to talk to somebody off the bridge, you really have to listen to to the point yes. where you when yeah. you know their kids' names. Yeah. Or their dad's names. And if you trip up, you're not listening to me. Yeah. You really have to pay attention. Mm. Yeah, as beautiful as the city pas as Pasadena is you know, the, the bridge is really well known. And you didn't say, but it's known as like the suicide bridge, right? Yeah. That's the name that 
people know it by. Yeah. Um, you but know, the compa- I, I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but I'm just uh, really in awe of the type of compassion you have to have to deal with this kind of person. I mean, patience and compassion. Oh, yes. I've, I've been so emotionally drained that uh, yeah. typically you, the handshakes, yeah. I've hugged people. Yeah. And, you know, they really appreciate that. And it's, it's not like, okay, I feel that I have to. It, it just, we connect it. Yeah. So you, you, you feel like they're pain. You, you, yeah. One of the, you want to save them. Right. Yeah. Are there services afforded uh, for you and you like officers like you, you know, who have experienced this? Cause how do you go back to work? You know, when some traumatic event has happened like right. that? We, we, we do have a, a wellness team at work, a support, a PO support team. If, if we go through something traumatic as that, they do come out and they talk to us and it, it's not like we're robots. We're, we're humans too. They, they do that, take that very seriously to make sure you're okay mentally as well. Sure. Yeah. Well, I want to get more into your event and maybe discuss how prevalent the issue of suicide is in the mm-hmm. community. I think everybody may know someone who has at least talked about it, maybe thought about it, right. maybe even tried it, but uh, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. At Wormuth Law, they believe that just because you speak a foreign language, come from a different culture, or simply don't know how to navigate the legal system, that should not prevent you from compensation from injury or receiving benefits. Their multicultural staff have been helping SGVers like you for over 38 years. Visit law888.com or call them at 626-784-7017 and tell them you heard about them on this podcast. Podcast. So we're back with uh, Officer Costa. Before we get into more of the uh, awareness around suicide and your event in September, uh, when we come back from break, we like to ask these questions uh, from these cars. They're 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 from this pack called Icebreakers, and they're they're not penetrating. Like uh, they're lighthearted, and it's just for people to know a little bit more about you and, and us also. So here we go. You can choose to answer or, or not. What was your first job? First job was with going through high school um, with the a, a USC campus. I can't remember that. It was a medical um, where I would go in into the hospitals and um, help uh, the, the nurses. I did that at Martin Luther King Hospital. Okay. Uh, USC Med Corps. That's what it was. Oh. Yeah, that was my first official job. Yeah. Wow. How old were you when your your first job? I like 15, 16. 15, 16? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, and Scott? Oh, I already know what you, this is. Yeah, you probably know we did half of a show on it, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> it, you're a uh, paper boy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's age what? 10? Oh, I started at uh, about 11. I think. 11. Oh, wow. Yeah, 11. Yeah. In the reign of Seattle. Mm. Uh, I still think that was like the hardest job I ever had in my life. Every day, <laughs> day in and day out, in this crappy Seattle weather, you have to go out for like two hours and deliver newspapers, wow. and it's raining, and cold, stormy. Anyway. But yeah. you, you, you loved it, though. Like, look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... I I hate Seattle weather. Oh, but you loved you loved being a paper boy, though. You enjoyed it. Uh, it was um, it was it was really good training, honestly, because you, ha- you had to do everything. Yeah, I see. Go back to our show and listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my first job when I was seventeen was uh, sixty three Delta ten in the U.S. Army, and I had that job for eight and a half years. What does that mean? Uh, so it's a it's a MOS, it's a military occupational specialty. They're, they're designated by numbers, right? So 63 is the um, mechanical field. Delta is the designator. That's like self-propelled artillery. I also had the Bravo designator, which was light wheel. So 63, Bravo and Delta. And then 10 is like your entry level. Wow. So you would be 10, 20, 30, 40. So yeah. your first job was? The military. When was wow. in the military. Yeah. Wow. My very first job. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> As I, like my, my mom signed me away when, you know, cause I was 17, I was underage. Yeah. And I remember, um, I actually was in Germany in my first unit at the age of 17, um, having a coffee 
and looking out, you know, the window of my own barracks and thinking like, this is awesome. I'm, I'm 17 and I'm living yeah. overseas and I'm by myself. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Go back to the show. So yes. suicide uh, awareness mm -hmm. and, and the event is called again, uh, walk to remember, uh, walk in, walk in remembrance, walk in remembrance, yes. walk in remembrance. Yes. So, so to bring awareness to suicide, yes. how, how prevalent is it uh, in, in, you know, from what you know, in, in, I would say California, the U S or even in Pasadena, uh, it, it doesn't matter what walk of life you're from. You could be, have all the money in the world. You can be the poorest person in the world. Mental health affects everybody. So it's, it's, it's we take it very seriously. Um, our team, our police station, our fire department, it could be anybody. And are people calling, you know, like, do they call 911? Do they call fire? Is it the people who are considering, you know, in the moment I, I, I'm going to take my life and they call or someone calls for them? Like, how, how does it, that typically play out? It goes both, both ways. It's, if they're calling, it's, they are, they, they want help. And, and if you feel that if a family member is seeing signs or a friend, they will call too. And we do, we take that very, very seriously. We'll go out and, you know, see if we could contact the person and, and see, you know, what we could do for them. I remember seeing a movie uh, about the suicide prevention line, I think is what it was called, but uh, where people would, who were considering suicide would call. And uh, this movie was called A Slender Thread. I remember that very clearly, maybe from, 60 years ago i don't know but about the people that would call on on these lines you know and sometimes it would be hours and hours that they would be on the phone is that right oh yeah is yeah. there a suicide prevention line in pasadena or is it is are you aware of no, anything like it's, that it's just countywide countywide right, okay right and then if they're they're determined to be in the city of Pasadena, then they will call us and have us go and make contact. If they, if they know where they are. Right. Or what, right. Okay. Okay. So these are trained professionals taking these calls and yeah. the calls could go on and For on. hours. Yeah. 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 I'm sort of conflicted with uh, what it means to be a recipient of someone saying, I'm thinking of killing myself. Mm -hmm because I've experienced um, in my own life that many times. And as I've gotten older, I, people I've telling you, or are you, you considering it? A person telling me, yeah. Oh. And so now, you know, now I'm, I'm older and I, I know that it's sometimes used as a, as a manipulative tool, right? Right. To, to bring someone under control, someone who loves you under control, right? And that's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And then my mind goes to like, well, I also know people who have, and those who have do, they don't even say they do. Right. And, and, and so is it always just a cry for help? Or are these people like on, on the edge? Like that, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wrestling with my own thoughts here, right? If someone's coming to me and they say this, my first thought is that they're not really going to do it. They're just asking for help in this right. moment. Right. And I'm scared of the person who's not saying anything, who's just projecting on the outside that everything's fine, and and then they take their life. It, it's tough because some people do hide it really well, but then if if you always have to take it seriously, if somebody said something, even if it's just trying to control, you still have to take it seriously. Um, the ones that don't say anything, it's, it's yeah, like you said, it's tough because it could just be just like that. There are warning signs though, right? That someone's maybe depressed, unhappy or something. Do you, what, what are some of those, if you could share, you know, for someone who may suspect someone's not doing well? well just kind of alienating themselves or, or just drinking way too much. Self-medicating with, you know, street drugs. That could be an indicator. Um, just got to really know your friends and family to know when something may be going on. Sure. You probably don't see it in most cases, and you know, until the moment you're confronted with it. You haven't seen the history. Correct. You've seen it just live in front of you. And so you, you don't see it building up. Right. And that's when you want to talk to their therapist or talk to their family members or friends to get that past history 
to better understand and then you go in and talk to the person and see if that you know kind of clicks Here, here's a term that i've only learned in the last maybe five years is is suicide by cop you know and i didn't even know what that was before have you heard this before oh yeah now that you mention it right people trying to get killed by a policeman that's right like intentionally like their their goal is to to commit suicide oh but they they i don't know they it, create some sort of scenario where they have to have a response and uh i guess try to get killed like right. is it is this a common thing or have you encountered this i can't remember the last time i did uh, but some people they don't want to take that last step and do it themselves and they mm. want us to do it for them or you know like running the traffic yeah that's a big thing but yeah it's it's some people just don't have don't want to do it themselves now sure. is it a new uh is it some sort of new thing that's developed or no, is it just that recently you've we've just heard of it but no, it's always been there it's always been there uh -huh. yeah yeah i mean i've even seen videos online with people like with toy guns, you know, like mm -hmm. knowing that they're going to get shot, but yeah. they just have toy guns or, yeah. mm. a, you know, an object that may be a miss, uh, you know, miss uh, analyzed as, as a weapon or something. Right. But well, I think that shows the complexity of a police officer's job, having to see through all of this, right? Yeah, and it's, it could happen in a split second. You got the big well, decisions. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So, so again, again, with my friend, right, he, he's, he says, oh, in the movies, you see this shot and there's this dramatic, you know, oh, and they fall down and, and he's witnessed, like, he's like, some people get hit a full magazine and they don't even go down, you know, and, and people are like, you, you think it's like a movie, but it's not. And, and he's trying to share with me, like, the instant that they have to react to, to something. Um, so one, it's not like the movies, right? And the other thing he says is... Um, People, he always mocks it. He's like, people's like, why can't you shoot them in the lake? <laughs> well, maybe you can speak to that. It's it's a smaller target, basically. That's what it, it you know. It's 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 hard. You can miss. Yeah, yeah. And then you have to look at your backdrop. What if you miss? Then, you know, you may hit some other poor poor person behind them. Yeah, yeah. It's hard enough to hit a target, let alone a moving target. Right. Um, right. Yeah. You know, if anyone and, and then when you shrink the target size, right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand what people like, maybe they see some video and they're like, Oh, I, if I were in that situation, I, I could have done that. But I, ju I just know it's, it's a very difficult job when you're faced, when you're confronted with that, like having to assess and your, you, maybe your life is at risk. You know, going back to what was said earlier uh, in the show, talking about communication and actually sharing uh, information and getting to know just the complexities of a job that a policeman has, a police officer has. I don't, it, you know, it's very easy to, you know, like you say, you see a video, why did they do that? But it's, it's much more nuanced when you have to figure, like you said, it's a split second. Right. You, you're, you're not given, uh, you know, a whole morning to think about how you're going to react. Right, and, and that's why we get trained to prepare ourselves for yeah. certain events. And, 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 you know, we don't always pull out our guns. We have less lethal. We have the tasers. We have pepper spray. Uh, we could go hands-on. So it all depends on the, the, the uh, scenario. Uh, right. Yeah. So it's But just that contact with being able to talk and interact with the police officer, I think, is very important to members of the community. Yes. You know, and uh, not look at the police as being, you know, the enemy. Right. Or, or you know, this force that, oh. you know. We're, we're all human. We're, yeah. We're, we're, we're law enforcement. Is, if you want to, people who get into law enforcement want to serve the community. That's uh -huh. the number one goal, to help. So we're not bad people. Yeah. So my, you know, I lived in New York and you know I always thought I always had this really good impression of of a New York cop you know like they're just they're on the street mm -hmm. they're on the street with the people and well anyway that's the good thing about New York people mix and so 
communication is so much easier. But yeah, it's harder here, isn't it? I mean, you're in cars, you're patrolling. Well, that's when we're not busy. That's when we get to engage with the community. We, yeah. we get out of our cars. Yeah. We go right. up and talk to people. Yeah. And see what the concerns are or just talk. Yeah. 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 We, we just, you don't always have to be in your car. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, if you're just seen as another person yep. and not as a robot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I, I grew up where in elementary school, if they asked you, what did you want to be when you grew up? Maybe, you know, 20% of the, the kids would say, I want to be a policeman. Oh, yeah. And, and I would right. say, like, the, the mindset has really shifted where it means maybe hard for younger generations to view this as a profession where they're like, oh, I want to, you know, serve my community in this way. And um, uh, it's, it's really unfortunate because, you know, if the community can have more contact and see the police force as something different, yeah, um, you know, I, I think it would be much stronger for for everyone. One hundred percent. But Eduardo, uh, we're gonna sort of shift gears here and um, get into more of uh, you as a person and uh, learn about the things that you like in the San Gabriel Valley. We refer to this as the SGV three. We like to. <laughs> have our guest tell us about three places they love to go or restaurants they love to eat at, events they have experienced in the San Gabriel Valley. So I love um, going up to the mountains and mountain bike riding um, up in the hills, in the mountain areas. Really good cardio. Uh, you really have to make sure you don't fly over your handlebars and yeah. just, being out, just being outside, hit that too. <laughs> Um, just being outside, just kind of a disconnect away from. Do you have a favorite trail or or place? I'm, I'm just all over. When when I was really into it, just all over the uh, up in the San Gabriel Valley, mm -hmm. uh, mountain the foothills yeah. there. Yeah, um, yeah. That's that's a common mm -hmm. uh, response we have, and sure. it's a special. Uh, in fact, there uh, right behind you is a picture there of you go. of uh, us our. Russell and I hike up there. We, we wanted to this morning, but it was just too, it was like practically raining. <laughs> yeah. So we called it off. But yeah, what would be a second thing uh, or place? Or? Second, and I, I like to stay active. Um, so I uh, enjoy running around, walking around, ro rollerblading around the Rose Bowl. Oh, yeah. Loop. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, again, you're outside. I love being outside. Yeah. Um, rollerblading. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Maybe go for a couple laps and then throw on your rollerblades and do a couple more laps. Awesome. So, yeah. yeah. I actually really enjoy rollerblading, but I haven't done that in years, yeah. I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't own a pair, but yeah. yeah. And I think the third, I know we get, we basically have to work the Rose Bowl events, but I, I really like to see the families on the parade route uh, come out and basically the world is looking yeah. at Pasadena. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's huge. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I love working it sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I like, I mean, we, we have to work it. We have to be there and, and, you know, I just like seeing the family feel of it. Yeah. 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 That, that kind of mixes the family feel of Pasadena mm -hmm. with, with the, um, the fame of, you know, national the most, stage, yeah. the most famous day yes. uh, of Pasadena's year. Yeah. 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 Eduardo, Officer Acosta, thank you for coming on the show and sharing, uh, you know, with our listeners, this awareness in this event. Remind them again, when is this event? What's the name of it? And how can they participate in this event? So it's going to be Walk in Remembrance. It's a um, suicide uh, awareness walk. Again, it's going to be September 13th. Um, setup time is going to be at 7 a.m and lot H of the Rose Bowl. We're gonna have the organization set up to pass out materials, talk to people, provide services. Special guest speakers are gonna come out. Um, so it's gonna be exciting to see how many people actually come out. It's open to the entire San Gabriel Valley community and beyond. Um, free event, just come out and support. So they don't need to register anything, they just show up. Uh, we're going to have a QR code. I'm going to send out a, another flyer. Just go ahead and if you're going to participate, awesome. 
there will be an opportunity to, to purchase a shirt and just come out free event. Awesome. Yeah. September 13th, Rose Bowl, yes. Lot H. Yes. Awesome. Officer Acosta, thank you again for coming on the show and sharing uh, this uh, with our listeners. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, there you go. There's another episode for you. Thank you for tuning in. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can check out our full catalog of episodes on our website, sgvmasterkey.com. And until next week, we'll see you then. You've been listening to the SGV Master Key Podcast. Our passion is the small businesses and the people that make up the San Gabriel Valley. And it's our honor to have them on the show. We hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure to like, rate, and review. The show is produced by Russell Mano. Edited by Victoria Allers of Kind Monster Productions. Thanks for listening and see you next time on the SGV Master Key Podcast. Master. No, kind of master.